Do you need a hunting rifle, but you don't have a lot of money to spend on it? Well, guess what? You're in luck, because today we're going to show you how to find an affordable hunting rifle. Hello everybody, welcome back to Look at Carnivore, the hunting guns and adventure channel for smart people. And you're smart because you're not watching some airheaded gazillionaire clickbait artist put out a bunch of fluff. You're here for some good information, some useful information, and by golly, we're going to give it to you today. Like we said in the front of the video, we're talking about finding a decent hunting rifle for not a lot of money. In other words, a low budget or affordable hunting rifle. Our channel depends exclusively on support from viewers like you. So we have a link down to our Patreon site down in the description if you'd kindly go down there. Show us a little love. The more budget we get, the better videos we can give you and the more we can give you. First of all, you don't need what they call Gucci gear. You don't need high-end stuff. You really don't. There's a lot of affordable gear out there that will get the job done. It's not maybe real racy. It's not high-speed stuff, but it will keep you in the game. It will allow you to hunt. You can do it re in a reasonable amount of comfort and with you can do it in a reasonable amount of comfort and effectively so the first big area that everyone's always thinking about when it comes to low budget hunting is the guns because everybody you know let's face it we're all focused on guns i like guns you like guns but again on that you don't need the gucci stuff principle there are a ton of affordable guns on the market these days in fact over the last 15 maybe 20 years at the most uh the market has gone incredibly the market has focused tremendously on providing what the industry calls value guns in other words they're as affordable as the gun manufacturers can potentially possibly make them and still make a profit selling them remember they got to stay in business because if they go out of business you're not going to have any guns unless you're going to build them in your basement in which case you better talk to the atf before you do that so there's a wealth of affordable guns out there from uh, you know all the major manufacturers for the most part. Ruger, uh, Savage, particularly they have very affordable models. There's imported guns uh, from you know they come in from Turkey and they're made offshore, Philippines, etc. And yeah, you're not buying American, and I get it. If you can buy American, I encourage you to do that. That's what we're here about. You know, in America, we should be supporting our own people. I get that part, but don't be afraid of buying something that meets your needs at a good price and it might be made elsewhere so sometimes you just have to go that route you know we've got great content at our local carnivore website as well the link's down in the description like everything else and we'd appreciate it if you go over there enjoy some of the great content we have over there we also have a store so you can go ahead and get some local carnivore branded merchandise which we know you'll like you can give it as gifts or wear it around we'd appreciate that let's dig into the specifics though First of all, you need to understand what you're going to be getting for your money. What we consider an affordable gun at a gun store, a brand new one, is going to have fewer features or less functionality to a certain degree than a higher end gun. Now you don't necessarily have to sacrifice important things like accuracy, which is really the most important thing, power and things like that. But let's put two guns side by side. Uh, first is a Savage 111. This is it chambered in 300 Winchester Magnum. And then we have a Winchester Model 70. And this is dates from the time when they reintroduced the pre-64 action. That is to say, the action that was derived directly from the Mauser M1898 with the controlled round feed. Now, when you look at these two guns side by side, they look basically like bolt action rifles with scopes on them. There's nothing seriously different, at least to the, uh, on first blush to the eye. But if you look into it a little closer, what you're going to find is, is over on the Savage, you're going to have a few things that are different and that cost the company less money to make the gun, but which cost the, which cost the manufacturer less money, which means they can pass that savings on to the customer, you, and give you a lower price point on that. On the Winchester here, we see that we have uh, some really nice features. This is the way hunting rifles used to be made back in, quote, the day, end quote. First of all, you'll notice that on, at the bottom of the magazine, what we have here instead of a detachable box magazine is a hinged floor plate with the magazine spring and follower held internally into the rifle. 
This was designed so that it would, this was designed purposely so that you would not accidentally drop out a magazine at the wrong moment. And you'll find that this is a feature that's retained on dangerous game rifles and things like that nowadays, even though there are other ways to do it. Now over on the Savage, you have a detachable box magazine. It's made out of, of course, plastic for the most part and some metal. Uh, this one's made out of metal. The newest ones, like for the Savage Axis and whatnot, are generally just all polymer. Not a bad thing necessarily, but it's not quite as groovy as maybe all steel. Well, is a detachable box magazine a significant problem when you're hunting? I'd say unless you're hunting dangerous game, no, not really. Uh, the magazines generally will stay in. However, this Savage, it doesn't have a very confidence-inspiring latch for the magazine up in the front there. It, it, just, it just feels kind of weak and kind of cheap. So what I do when I take this rifle out in the field is I put a little bit of duct tape under the belly of the gun up against the magazine to hold the magazine in just to make sure it doesn't inadvertently get knocked loose or fall out or anything like that and get damaged or lost, which would be really bad. You should, if you have a detachable magazine hunting rifle, carry a spare magazine. If you like what you see here on the channel and you think you're getting value, give us a big like, thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and hit that bell down there so that you'll get notified of every new video that we put out. The other thing you're going to get on budget rifles is you're not going to get the controlled round feed. Here we see on the Winchester the really large claw extractor and what that does is it gives you very positive extraction. It basically encompasses almost a third of the rim on the cartridge and it'll yank that cartridge out no matter how stuck it gets from heat or overpressure or anything. It'll generally, if that cartridge head is still attached to the case, it'll probably pull that thing out of there. Uh, and extract it and eject it just fine. And the control round feed derives its name from the fact that as the round, as a round comes up out of the magazine, instead, and the bolt comes forward, the bolt cams the rim of the cartridge up under the extractor immediately, and the extractor holds it to the bolt face and points it directly at the chamber so it doesn't have to go and jump up a ramp or anything like that. There's no geometry involved. The extractor holds it in place and it goes right into the chamber directly. So it's very reliable feed method. It's a very reliable feed method. Now over on the Savage, you see, has what's called push feed. And that's a lot like if you're familiar with semi-automatic pistols, when the bolt comes forward, it just, uh, or other semi-automatic rifles like ARs, it just, the bottom of the bolt catches the top of the rim of the cartridge and just pushes the cartridge forward out of the magazine the nose of the bullet will then engage some ramps, usually right at the chamber mouth or even in the magazine and then into the chamber mouth. And it'll have to go up at a slight angle and then level itself out and then get pushed into the chamber. And so push feed is not absolutely as reliable as controlled round feed, but is it unreliable? No, for most of the hunting situations you will ever encounter, it's perfectly reliable. The main thing is to keep the gun vertical. If you turn the gun on its side or anything like that, uh, it may not feed. In fact, the top round might fall out as it goes forward. There's a lot of possibilities. So if you need absolute reliability of feeding at any angle, you have to go with the Mauser control feed system. Now the other thing that you will find on budget guns and low budget guns is the safety. Uh, generally, you're going to find a tang mounted safety or a lever that's right, maybe uh, jutting out of the stock right next to the bolt or something like that. And most of the lower end rifles have just a two position safety. Now, this Savage 111 is of the is based on the original Savage 10 and 11 series that were developed in the 19, early 1960s. But this is a more modern version, which I purchased used. And that's a really, we're gonna to talk to you about that in a few minutes. The safety on this particular Savage has three positions. It has full safe, which locks the bolt. It has then safe, but allows the bolt to maneuver, to be extra, uh, allows the bolt to be cycled. So if you need to, you can pull rounds in and out of the magazine using the bolt and the extractor without having to be too concerned about tripping the sear accidentally and discharging the weapon. And then of course it has full forward, it has the fire position. Now, it's very important, in my opinion, that any rifle you pick, unless you're just strictly in a hunting blind or something like that and you're not moving around uh, and can control the bolt and make sure it doesn't open accidentally, it's imperative that you have a safety that locks the bolt closed when it's on safe. 
I've actually been walking along back in the past with a gun that was on safe, but it didn't lock the bolt. And somehow the bolt got caught on, I don't know what, some brush or my clothing or whatever. It sure as heck, it unlocked, dropped down because the gun was on my shoulder on a sling, vertical. And the bolt fell down. I didn't hear it. And it ejected the top cartridge. And when I went later, and I didn't know about this until later when I saw an animal and I bring the, brought the gun up to my eye and realized, oh, the bolt is open. And I looked in and it's like, there's no round in the chamber or anything. Please share this video. Put it out there. Let's get it to your friends, the people you like, the people you don't like. Let's put some legs on this bad boy, shall we? On like the Savage Axis, the Ruger American, uh, the Mossberg Patriot, all these lower end guns, you're going to find it only has a two position safety and on safe, the bolt remains active. In other words, you can open and close the bolt while it's on safe. Yeah, technically the weapon has been safed, but you need to be very careful on how you carry it in the field. And quite frankly, if you can find an inexpensive gun with a proper three position safety or a two position that locks that bolt closed on safe, that's the gun you want to get. Now the Savage here has what they call their AccuTrigger. If you go into the older models that came out prior to, I think the early 2000s, those will have the old standard trigger, which was terrible. Uh, count on buying like a Timney or something, an aftermarket trigger to drop in uh, to fix that because the old triggers on the old Savages were terrible. The new Rugers have an adjustable trigger similar to the Accu trigger. However, they must have gotten around uh, Savages patents somehow. So the mechanism is a little different, but it's user adjustable. Hey, what do you think about what we're saying on this video? Go ahead down in the comments, let us know. The other thing you're going to find on low budget or affordable guns is the stocks are all going to be synthetic stocks. If for you people that are just in love with uh, highly uh, figured Turkish walnut and things like that, it's not going to happen. You're going to have to have a synthetic stock, but they're very, they're completely weatherproof. Uh, they don't change dimensions with humidity and temperature. So the guns usually stay absolutely on zero. Uh, all my synthetic guns, stocked guns, I've never had them wander off zero ever. So that's a big plus on that. And you know, let's face it, hunting guns get banged around a lot and you're not going to worry about getting scuffs or nicks or deep gouges or anything in a synthetic stock. The other thing on guns to think about is used guns. Now, unfortunately, with the high demand of guns, especially uh, starting in 2020 and still really hasn't, you know, slowed down much at all, the gun market has basically gotten turned upside down. Since it's so hard to get guns and guns have gotten so expensive, especially on new guns, even the low budget guns, the prices have continually gone up over the last three to four years. And they don't show any signs of slowing down, especially with the new inflation rates. And if you've checked the spot price of steel, for instance, and guns are made out of steel, that does not go down. It keeps going up and up. So the material costs go up. So the price to the manufacturer goes up and the price to use the consumer goes up. It's just simple economics. With that in mind, however, used guns are not quite the value center that they used to be because given the price of a new gun, a used gun can still command 90 or even 100 or even more than 100% of its original selling price. And so it's kind of hard to, given the fact that there's really affordable new guns on the market, whether or not a used gun's right for you. Keep in mind, if you're looking in for a used gun, you need to know what you're doing and you can check the gun out correctly and make sure that it's going to be operational and safe for you to buy. But if you look around and you do a little horse trading or you maybe trade something that you don't need anymore for a gun that you do want or need, then you can save a lot of money. The other thing to do is just pick one gun. You don't need a battery of guns. You don't need five, 10 guns for hunting. I mean, it's cool if you can. I mean, if you can afford it, go for it. But we're talking low budget. So you just need one gun. The trick here is to pick a gun that's chambered for a cartridge that will be appropriate for all the different game species you plan to hunt. So if it's just deer, you don't need a lot of power there. But if you're doing everything else, deer, elk, potentially bear, bison, whatever it might be, you might have to get something a little more different, a little more powerful. But the trick is pick one caliber that will do all the work that you need and then have that one rifle and stick to it. So how do we decide which is the best cartridge? Well, it's fairly straightforward in my opinion. Basically what you want to do is determine what the largest, i.e. heaviest body weight animal 
you plan to hunt with this gun is, and also the maximum engagement range that you anticipate having to shoot at those animals. So let's look at if we're just after white-tailed deer, and especially if it's eastern whitetails, and there's you don't anticipate hunting anything bigger, you're not going to hunt black bear, you're not going to hunt elk if maybe they've imported some elk to your state back east. I think Tennessee and Kentucky now have some elk out there. But if you're just hunting that, the smaller animals, i.e. less than 200 pounds body weight, you can get away with 243, 308s, uh, 6.5 Creedmoors. There's a lot of possibilities there. So again, select the cartridge that is designed to deal with the heaviest, largest animal at the greatest distance you anticipate to hunt. So let's say you're out west or you think you might go hunting out west in the United States, for instance, and you might be hunting elk or moose or black bear, or you might even go up to Alaska for a grizzly bear hunt. Well, that's completely different. Now I would suggest at a minimum you want a 30-06, uh, the other issue is what areas in the West are you going to hunt? Are they wide open where you're going to have longer shots or is it in deep, thick, heavy timber like northern Idaho, western Montana, places like that, or uh, in the heavy bush in Alaska? In which case, you, a 30 6 or something like that is fine. If you're shooting longer, we want flatter shooting cartridges, uh, 300 Winchester Magnum, 7mm Remington Magnum on the newer cartridges, uh, 6.5 PRC, 7mm PRC, Maybe some of the new Nosler cartridges. Uh, you might even want to step up into the Weatherbees or something like that. But again, get a cart get a rifle that's chambered for a cartridge that will take the largest animal at the longest distance you plan to shoot. And then the other thing to keep in mind is ammunition availability. And I mentioned you could go with like the RUMs, the Remington Ultra Mags, or perhaps the Weatherbees or something like that. The problem is those cartridges are really hard to find in factory loadings. If you're willing to load your own, uh, assuming you can get primers, <laughs> magnum primers at that, and those are right now basically non-existent on the shelf. But good luck finding them if you can. But if you already got the primers and you've got powder, uh, you already got brass or something, you can certainly do that. I would suggest, however, if this is new to you, if you're new to hunting, this is your first hunting rifle, or you just need that low budget hunting rifle because whatever reason you just can't afford a more expensive rifle, then pick a loading that is readily available on the shelf. 300 Winchester Magnum, 30 out 6, 308. Those are probably your best choices, and those will take care of any of the animals we've talked about, except for uh, now with the Magnums uh, and the out 6. You can handle grizzly with those up north, the, uh, the Alaskan brown bears. You can handle those. I wouldn't recommend it for Kodiak, but people have done it. Uh, but if you're in the lower 48 and you're talking and you're talking smaller animals, or at least you're not doing anything like elk or whatever, the 308 would probably be your best choice. Lots of ammo out there for 308 still on the shelves, plenty of availability, and it's relatively, by today's standards, affordable. 30 out 6, a little harder to find, but a little more versatile, especially if you anticipate going after larger, potentially dangerous animals. Uh, it's a great cartridge for black bear. 308 is too. Use the proper bullet, that's the main thing. And then if you need the reach and or the extra power, go for a Magnum. But again, I would go with something that is relatively is available and not terribly expensive. Uh, the short mags, the Winchester short mags, the prices right now in those ammunitions are anywhere from $80 to $120 a box, if you can find a box. Versus you go to 300 Winchester Magnum, it's readily available on the shelf, and we're talking on the low end in the 40-ish range, and then for the premium loadings, 50, 60, 70 dollars a box. Not super cheap, but cheap enough. So that's what you want to think about as far as chambering that rifle in order to get one good affordable hunting rifle. Make sure that you're getting in a cartridge that takes affordable available ammunition. We hope you got some good value out of this. We thank you so much for spending your valuable time here with us at Loca Carnivore today. And as always, stay aware, stay safe, be kind, and we'll see you next time on Local Carnivore.